pleasure to present the next speaker, Lisa Picirillo from uh, MIT, who will speak about uh, four manifolds with boundary and uh, fundamental group uh, Z. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much for coming. Um, I didn't have the privilege of, of knowing Jones, but it, uh, it's really an honor to have been invited to speak. Um, and before I get going, uh, I'm afraid there's, there's something I should confess, which is that I, um, I don't always necessarily read all of my emails. Um, and so when I arrived yesterday, I learned that this was gonna be a slides talk. Um, so these slides are somewhat new to this world and they're a little less polished than they should be. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so this is, uh, talk is gonna be about joint work with my, uh, my colleagues, uh, Anthony Conway and Mark Powell. Uh, and <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about primarily a classification theorem for topological four manifolds. Um, but I think there aren't so many four manifold topologists here, so I wanted to start off by giving some context for what we know and, and largely don't know about both topological and smooth manifolds. Um, and, and as I was trying to think about like how to structure like the, the kind of results that I want you to have a little context for, um, I yeah, wait, let's stick, there we go. Uh, I came up with this chart. So um, this is how I'm going to organize the literature today. Let me explain how this chart's going to work. So across the top, we have, across the top, there we go, we have three like very basic uh, things you might like to understand about manifolds. And today for me, all manifolds are going to be four-dimensional. So you might like to understand the manifolds themselves, up to homeomorphism or diffeomorphism or something like this. Uh, you also might like to understand knots in them. Um, and for me, co-dimension two is, is surfaces. So I'd like to understand um, surfaces in my four manifolds. And you also might like to understand like mapping class groups, so, so maps from the manifold to itself. So I'm gonna try to give you um, some results of, of all of these types. <clears throat> um, but you know, we're not very good at studying four manifolds uh, yet, so I'm gonna restrict uh, heavily the fundamental group that my manifolds are allowed to have. I'm only gonna consider uh, four manifolds with uh, trivial fundamental group or, or pi one Z. Um, and in the case of surfaces, it's gonna be the complement that has that group. Okay, so, so those are the kind of results I wanna talk about. And then I wanna talk about results in, in both categories. So I'll give you some topological results. And, and, and people who study topological four manifolds, which most of the time isn't me, though this is a topological uh, result, um, they're like reasonably good at their job. So, so they can really prove kind of actual theorems. Um, so, so anything that gets written in a topological row will be a classification theorem. Um, <clears throat> and down here in smooth, um, that's me most of the time. We're not very good at our jobs. We don't have almost any positive results. So um, all that you're gonna see down here is like uh, us pointing out that whatever is known topologically uh, fails smoothly and results like that are called exotica. Um, I'm also gonna talk about like two types of manifolds here. In, in both categories, there's, there's kind of a real distinction between the sorts of results you can get if you do or do not have boundary on your manifold or your surface. Topologically, your life is harder if you have boundary because you have like more data that you're gonna need to try to classify. Um, but smoothly, your, your life is easier if you have boundary because you have more data and that helps you find somewhere for an obstruction to live. So, so I'll give you results kind of of both types. Um, any questions about the chart? Or, good, oh yeah. Oh, four, everything is four. For, Yes, so, so here, oh sorry, this, this is a two, a surface embedded in a four manifold, good. Other questions? Okay, great. Uh, so my surface can have boundary uh, if, uh, yeah, I'm gonna allow it to have boundary or not. So, so right, for surfaces, that means the surface does or doesn't. Okay, great, so, so a preview of where we're going. Um, we have results in, in all of these boxes, and we'll get to that um, later. And I just wanna set up a couple of pretty standard conventions. Let me just comment on this one. I'm assuming all my topological manifolds are spin. That is not necessary. It doesn't appear in any of the theorems I'll state. I'm just taking it for now because it makes the statements a little simpler. Okay, great. So I wanna start off by talking about 
uh, the first two columns. Uh, what do we know about four manifolds? <clears throat> and uh, we'll start off with a result that I think you all know, um, which is that Friedman gave us a, a classification of simply connected closed four manifolds. Um, and I've, I've stated his theorem up here, um, and I, I want to point out something about it. I think we usually think of Friedman's theorem as saying, you know, these types of four manifolds are determined by their intersection form, but, but it's a little stronger than that. He actually proves that there's a bijection between simply connected closed four manifolds, topological ones, and, and their form. So for any reasonable form, you can find the four manifold that has it. <clears throat> Uh, and, and once you have a topological classification, then the smooth folks want to um, know whether it's, it's true. And um, this one is, is not true smoothly. That's a that's <clears throat> really groundbreaking work of Donaldson. Um, and uh, well, that, you know, in some sense, that says Friedman's theorem is not true smoothly. That's the end of the story. But, um, but we're not actually satisfied with that because there's this conjecture some people are interested in, um, which, which asks whether the four sphere is exotic. Um, and that, that's very hard. We don't know how to work on that. So there's this kind of crude program towards uh, trying to understand the Poincare conjecture, which is to just try to find smaller and smaller exotic closed simply connected four manifolds. So, so that was quite an industry, um, though it's, it's a bit stalled. The state of the art is um, that CP2 connects on two CP2 bars is exotic. That's the simplest thing we have. <clears throat> Okay, so, so that's kind of the state of things for simply connected four manifolds closed. And um, what about with boundary? Topologically, we have a classification. This is due to Boyer. And, um, and smoothly, we, um, well, we want to know whether it's true. And, and I mentioned last slide, it's supposed to be easier to get exotic results when you have boundary. Um, and it is, we have a very strong one. Ockelot and Ruberman proved that, in fact, there are contractible exotic four manifolds. So, so that's, you know, that's the simplest thing you could have. So, so in a sense, this is like the with boundary Poincaré conjecture, and it's, and it's false. Um, so, so we're very proud of that result, but, um, but maybe we shouldn't be because, like, we should be trying to prove that things are true and not just, like, stomping on the topological results. Um, so, so you should ask us, like, what can we do towards a classification? And the answer is, is nothing. Um, and then you could ask us, like, can we do anything structural at all? And, and we have one result. So um, this is something called the, the Cork theorem, and it's due to kind of a lot of people around 1995. And, and I, I wrote what it says here, but let me just try to tell you what it says with a picture. Um, so, so what it says is if you have any pair of homeomorphic, simply connected four manifolds, it doesn't matter if they have boundary or not, then, oh, and these manifolds are smooth, then, then they're related by doing this, this kind of surgery where you cut out a smooth, contractible, co-dimension zero sub-manifold, and you replace it with some other uh, contractible four-manifold. And that will let you toggle between any two homeomorphic, simply connected, smooth four-manifolds. So we, we have no classification, but, but we, at the very least, we, we kind of know that, that homeomorphic smooth manifolds are related in this way. Uh, any questions so far about Simply Connected 4? <clears throat> yeah? But, but is there a non-exotic uh, Is there a non-exotic what? Oh, um, that's a great question. We don't know. Uh, that's going to be my default answer to like every question anyone asks. Go ahead. Is there any control numbers you wanted to prove? Um, a little bit. Uh, you can like for one, you so so they're definitely homeomorphic. You can actually take them to be diffeomorphic, not rail boundary. Um, that might be a little confusing if you haven't worked with this stuff before. You can take their boundary manifolds to have an interesting involution. Um, but we can't say that like it's always the same thing or that it doesn't have like an arbitrarily nasty handle decomposition or anything like that. Okay, good. So the results I want to talk about today are um, in fact about four manifolds with pi one z. Um, <clears throat> so there, um, there's, there's some stuff that, that's already known. We have a classification for the closed ones from Friedman and Quinn. Um, 
topological people want to know, uh, sorry, the smooth people want to know if, if this is false. Um, and it is false, but by kind of a trick. It's a theorem of Vedusi that anytime you have simply connected exotic manifolds, if you, if you connect sum on in S1 times S3, it's still exotic. So, so fine, we have exotica with pi 1z, but this is somehow not maybe the right thing. It's not inherent to the pi 1. Um, <coughs> Uh, but we do have we do have examples that are a little more inherent. Um, but something that hasn't really taken off as an industry is trying to produce small ones. And um, this is less sexy. There's no Poincaré conjecture here, I guess. But but like there's some really basic questions that we don't know the answer to. Um, and and it's you know I think it's surprising that we're going after the Poincaré conjecture when when things like this are open because. For, for manifolds that have some pi one, it, it really should actually be much easier to show that this manifold is exotic. There are obstructions in terms of things like what kind of three manifolds can represent the H3. Um, you don't have anything like that in the simply connected case, but here we have like some real obstructions that you could conceivably use, but, um, but nobody has done this. <clears throat> okay, so, so that's the state of the things for closed four manifolds with pi 1z, and, and the results I want to talk to you about today are for pi 1z with boundary. So our main theorem, this is not a technical statement, um, <clears throat> is a classification of, of these manifolds um, with a couple of hypotheses. So um, let, me, let me point a little bit at the shape of this theorem. So this is a bijection result, just like Friedman's was. Um, about the bijection, my collaborators proved the injectivity last year, and we proved surjectivity. Um, and, and so what are, what are the two sets? On the left, you have the topological set. So this is topological four manifolds with pi 1z and with a fixed boundary three manifold. Um, certainly any two four manifolds that are homeomorphic and have boundary have to have homeomorphic boundaries. So it's reasonable to split the classification up in terms of the boundary three manifold. And then there's a technical hypothesis. I need pi one of the boundary to surject. Um, and there's another technical hypothesis, which I'll tell you about later. So, so that's the kind of manifolds we're classifying. And then we're going to classify them in terms of three invariants, which I'll, I'll make more clear later. But um, briefly, one of them is, is, in fact, the inclusion map from pi 1 of the boundary into the manifold. The second is some kind of intersection form. That should be familiar. Friedman's theorem is in terms of an intersection form. And then there's something else, something we're calling the automorphism invariant. That should not be familiar. Uh, I'll tell you a little more about it later. And any questions about, like, the kind of shape of the theorem statement or anything else. Okay, good. So we also want to know, now that we have this classification, what's going on smoothly. And um, of course, it's false. And in fact, that was already known. Ockblit and Ruberman also proved that there is an exotic homotopy S1. So again, this is the simplest thing you could have in this pi one. Um, but we're going we're gonna to try to prove a better result, even though they already did the simplest thing. Um, and, and to tell you like, why you might want to do that, let, let me say something about like, all of this exotica down here. Um, all of these theorems are like, very specific. They're, they, they're not sort of blanket type things. So you know, just because we can produce a closed, simply connected exotic manifold with B2 equals 3, uh, that does not mean we can produce such a manifold with, I don't know, B2 equals 5 in definite form. Like, we absolutely cannot do that. Um, so you might want to know, like, instead of just that there are scattered examples, that there's some kind of ubiquitous, ubiquity statement for exotica, and um, that's, that's what we prove um, for pi 1z and, and with boundaries. So for any intersection form that, that might reasonably be an intersection form, um, there are exotic manifolds with that form. <coughs> and we really don't know this in the closed case. Maybe a final thing you might want to know um, about uh, the smooth setting for, for pi 1z is do we have any structural type results? And um, embarrassingly, we don't. Like, even if you just change the pi 1 to z, that we, we don't have a quark theorem. So, so the plan for the talk is um, <clears throat> I want to sort of stop stating literature because I, I like talks that really get their hands dirty. So I'm going to go a little bit into what these invariants are and um, outline the proof of this, this classification theorem. And then I'll come back and talk about surfaces in the literature there and, and what we showed. Questions?
I didn't hear the second half of the question. When I do that connected sum, what? So you, you write the sum two or some middle on the day, the next sum, zero. To the, two. oh, that's a two. Yeah, there's two CP2 bars getting summed on there. Okay, good. So uh, I'm gonna talk about the three invariants. So the first one um, is, is a very easy thing to state. It's, it's the inclusion-induced map from pi one of the boundary into pi one of the manifold. Certainly if I give you a four manifold, this is an algebraic piece of data you can read off from it. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, it, it turns out that, that this map alone can obstruct homeomorphism um, rel boundary. Uh, maybe a quick comment going back aside. Uh, in this theorem statement, we're taking, we're working up to homeomorphism rel boundary. We, we also have a statement for just homeomorphism, but it's a little messier. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna try to show that, um, that this map can be, you can use it to show that some four manifolds aren't homeomorphic rel, rel boundary. So the examples I'm, of four manifolds I'm gonna try to compare are, um, S1 times B3, boundary connect sum S, uh, D2 times S2, and then the same sum ands, boundary connected sum in the other order. So the boundary of both of these manifolds is the connected sum of two copies of S1 times S2. So this is the boundary of the first manifold and the boundary of the second over here, and this, this sort of tick mark is to, to show you that there's a CP, uh, S1 times S2 over here and another one over here. So th those are our boundary manifolds, and I want to identify a particular um, pi one element in here, which is, which is S1 times a point maybe in the first factor. Okay, and I, I'm gonna pay attention to where that goes in pi one of the filling. So here, here's my fillings, um, <clears throat> and, and well, what, what's, the, what's the map on pi one? Um, on the left-hand side, gamma is gonna map into the generator, but on the right-hand side, gamma is mapping into uh, nothing. There's sort of no pi one over here. And so that's gonna tell me that there can't be a homeomorphism rel boundary uh, between these two manifolds because you know, rel boundary, it can't move gamma and it's not allowed to send a, a non-trivial class onto a trivial class. So that's sort of why this is an invariant. So um, I want to say, uh, I want to stay on this slide a little bit to sort of set up a running example that we'll use to study the other invariants. Um, <clears throat> and, and I also think, you know, the, the, the part of the theorem I'm going to try to sketch a proof for you of is the surjectivity side. So, so let's start thinking like we're going to prove a surjectivity result. Like what's happening here is we have a fixed boundary three manifold and then you're going to give me a set of invariants and I'm going to need to build you a four manifold. So, so let's just get started with the, with a fixed boundary manifold and uh, example of the first invariant. So let's suppose you tell me you want your boundary to be the zero surgery on the figure eight knot, and you tell me you want your, your inclusion-induced map to be the abelianization map. Um, <clears throat> so this f three manifold um, has a surgery diagram that looks like this. Um, and I am not drawing the left connected up to the right because the picture gets messy, but it is. So that yellow thing is actually a knot. Um, and it's not super important that you're, that you're very familiar with surgery diagrams for three manifolds. Let me tell you just like what I want you to know about this three manifold. This black thing right here, that gives you an S1 times S2. Um, and this, this green curve is the sort of S1 factor of it. And then, you know, and then there's a the yellow knot surgery. You're doing surgery on some other knot in S1 times S2. That's how you can think about this manifold. Um, and so, so you want a filling of this, and you want a filling where the inclusion maps the abelianization. This green curve is a generator of H1 here. So, so what you're gonna want is that that curve goes to something non-trivial in pi one of the filling. Um, so I can build you something like that. Um, here's an example. So, so how am I thinking about this four manifold? The black tube is gonna be S1 times B3. Again, the left-hand side is getting glued up to the right. Um, <clears throat> so that's a four manifold, and it certainly has boundary S1 times S2, so it's kind of filling the black part of our boundary manifold. And then in order to sort of get this yellow surgery to happen, we'll attach a two handle to this S1 times B3 along this curve. 
And, and we notice that, that, well, this yellow gamma stretches out to the S1 here. So this is, this is indeed mapping to a non-trivial element, in pi one of the filling as we wanted. Any, any questions about any of this? Maybe a comment, by the way, while you're thinking of questions. To the experts, I'm, I'm, I'm now quite sure that I got the crossing wrong in yellow there. Um. Okay. So second invariant. Uh, it's gonna be some kind of intersection form. Uh, let me start off by reminding you what the sort of normal integer-valued intersection form is. It's just this pairing on H2 of the four manifolds. What it does is you take a surface representing the classes you'd like to pair, and you ask how many times they intersect. Um, let's, like, check it uh, for, oops, our four manifolds here. Um, so H2 over here is, uh, there's one generator because this two-handle is stuck to a null homotopic curve. So we have one generator of our H2. So we can just ask how it pairs with itself. And, um, well, it turns out to intersect itself once sort of because of this framing. It's not important that you understand that. I'm gonna be more interested in how classes intersect things that aren't themselves. Um, but that's our intersection form, <coughs> the usual one. And if we were Friedman, this would be the intersection form we'd be happy with. Um, but but we're kind of not happy with this intersection form because, it, well, because it doesn't capture enough data. And the, the data we'd like to capture is not just what is the H2 and how does it interact with itself. We also kind of want to know how the H2 interacts with the pi one. And the way to capture that is by instead of taking the homology of the manifold, to take the homology of the universal cover and consider it pairing there. Um, let me immediately specify to our situation. We have pi one z. So um, we're gonna be looking at a pairing on the homology of the infinite cyclic cover, and it's gonna spit a Laurent polynomial. Um, and for notational convenience, lambdas the Laurent polynomials for the rest of the talk. So um, I'll tell you how it does this in a second. First, though, like, I'm gonna have to think about the homology of the infinite cyclic cover. Let me, over in our running example, like, get the infinite cyclic cover, like, in the, in the picture. <clears throat> so, I claim the infinite cyclic cover over here is, is this guy. Um, why is that? Well, what was this manifold? It was, like, S1 times B3, and then, you know, some two handles. So, to take the cover, we're just gonna cut the, uh, cut the S1, stretch it out. So, this is R times B3 here, and then we see a whole bunch of copies of the two-handle, and don't worry about why they're three-framed. <clears throat> so the, um, so, so good, that's, that's the manifold that we're looking at the homology of. That's kind of where um, our intersection form's gonna, that's what our intersection form is on, and, and what is the intersection form? Um, well, again, if you wanna pair two classes, you'll take a surface representing each class, and now you're gonna ask how the surface representing the first class inter intersects not just the second class, but all of its translates. And, and you'll record, um, sorry, uh, sort of which translation you're hitting with with a formal variable. Um, let me break here for questions about this definition. I think many people won't have seen this. Um, or questions about the running example. Yeah. If you are, perhaps I'm a little bit confused, this gamma, right? You, you need to choose which one has i equal zero, right? I could, uh, I don't know, probably not completely clear which one. Yeah, that's right. You can choose it arbitrarily. Um, in a second, I'll tell you I want to choose that one. Uh, but, but indeed, you need to pick a preferred thing. Uh, other questions? Yeah, so Anton got, you, got, got me to show you my second slide. Um, I wanna, I wanna uh, try to compute, at least vaguely, the equivariant intersection form for this example. Um, so, so what's the H2 of, of X tilde? Um, well, as a module over the Laurent polynomials, it's finitely generated. It's just generated by, by this thing Anton pointed out. Um, Right, you can get to all the other homology classes by, by multiplying by like a formal t variable. 
And so all I need to ask is how does this class intersect itself? Um, so when i equals zero, we're just asking literally like how does the sort of surface represented by this two handle intersect itself? It's gonna be three again because of the framing. Don't worry about that. The more interesting thing is when we ask how does this class inter intersect its translates? So when i equals one, we're asking how does this class intersect class coming from this two handle? And that's gonna be minus one because of this linking. And that gets us this, this minus t inverse in our, um, in, in our form. And similarly, um, when i is, is minus one, we get uh, an intersection. And if i is any bigger than that, well, this class doesn't intersect any of these classes out here or down here. So that's um, loosely what this, what this intersection form is, and this is our second invariant. <coughs> It's just this kind of covers soup up of the, the intersection form that Friedman has. Good, so um, I owe you another hypothesis um, on the theorem statement, here it is. Um, we need to know that the H1 of the boundary of the cover is torsion. You should think of this as an analog of asking that the boundary be a rational homology sphere. If I hadn't taken a cover, if we were just working over Z, that's what I'd be asking for. <clears throat> okay, um, and it, there's sort of one more warning here. Um, I'm gonna try to prove a surjectivity statement in a minute, so you're gonna get to give me a, a manifold, a map of pi one, a form, and some other stuff, and, and I have to build you a manifold, so, so I, want, <laughs> I wanna point out that you can't give me just any form. There's some algebraic restrictions on what kind of form could possibly have the boundary and the, the map that you've already chosen. And, and I'll say that if, if the form, it, satisfies those restrictions, I'll say the form presents the, the boundary and the map. Okay, good. I like questions, so I'm gonna check in again. Okay, so third invariant. This is a mysterious one. <coughs> um, <coughs> It's gonna remain largely mysterious. I'm only gonna tell you kind of morally what it does. Uh, let me start off by telling you that there's a short exact sequence um, that looks like this. It comes from the long exact sequence of a pair of the cover and its boundary. And what you should think of the automorphism invariant as measuring is this map. Certainly that map is a piece of algebraic data that you can read off of some four manifold that you have. So this is an invariant I can record of a manifold. <coughs> And um, you know, what, it's, what, it's, what it's giving you is, it's, it's sort of saying what's the relationship between H2 of the filling, in a sense, and H1 of the boundary manifolds. So slightly more geometrically, like what, it, what it's telling you is if I have some filling down here and, and some boundary manifold and I pick a homology class in the boundary, like what relative class should I expect this H1 class to bound? And it's kind of reasonable that you would expect to, you would expect to have to tell me some data like this. Like so far, you know, if I'm gonna build you a manifold, so far what you've needed to tell me is what do you want the boundary three manifold to be? And then, you know, you've told me you want this filling to have pi one z. And the first invariant I asked you for is something like how do you want the pi one of the boundary to interact with that pi one of the filling? That's our first invariant. And then our second invariant is like basically the homology, the H2 of the filling. And so this third invariant I'm asking you for, oops, sorry, is, is how do you want the H2 of the filling that you just demanded to interact with the H1 of the boundary that, that you've also imposed on me? And that's what this final invariant's measuring. <clears throat> and let me just show you that um, this is sort of what it looks like as an object. It takes values in the set of isometries between some forms that I'm definitely not gonna define, you don't have to worry about. Um, so, so this is some group that I, I don't particularly like to make sense of, but like number theorists can make sense of. Um, and a comment is that it can be infinite order. So um, a, a consequence of our classification theorem is, is that you can have an infinite family of pi one z topological form manifolds with boundary that have the same boundary, the same induced map, the same equivariant intersection form, and they're only distinguished by this invariant.
questions. Oh, yeah, they are, uh, because I have Pi 1Z. Uh, yeah, thanks. Good, OK. So um, here's the theorem again, slightly messier. Um, now we have both of our hypotheses stated over here on the left in the topological set. And over here on the right, um, I've added some like technical assumptions to you know what the invariants like what they are and and what kinds of invariants you're allowed to pick for example the form has to present and this is um this is pretty close to a full statement of the classification okay so um what i want to do now is is outline how we prove this and and i'm just going to outline the surjectivity part if you want injectivity you have to invite my collaborators to speak um, so, any, any questions before I start this? Okay, great. So you gave me a boundary three manifold and you gave me all this data and I need to build you a filling. And um, here's what we do. You start with the three manifold cross I. Fine. Um, and then you're going to attach a whole bunch of two handles to it. Um, according to the automorphism invariant. You know, I told you the automorphism invariant is saying something like which H1 classes in the boundary are gonna correspond to which relative H2 classes. And, and what I'm doing here is I'm forcing the automorphism invariant to be realized by like sticking handles to those H1 classes exactly like the odd invariant tells me to. <clears throat> this is the main technical step of the theorem. Um, there's, there's sort of a lot of machine, like, mechanics behind this. Um, and a comment is that so far this thing we've built is, is smooth. Um, let's let Y prime be the boundary of this thing we've built when we finish adding all our two handles. Uh, and the next step is that we argue that the homology of the infinite cyclic, the H1 of the infinite cyclic cover of Y prime is trivial. So I started off with a, with a Y that by assumption was kind of a rational homology sphere, that homology was torsion. And once I finish adding my two handles, um, the homology is trivial. So you should think that now Y prime is kind of the analog of an integer homology sphere. And the reason we want that is because we're gonna show that um, manifolds like that, these, these sort of integer homology sphere type doodads, uh, they bound topologically now a homotopy S1. And this, is, this, this step is surgery theoretic. This maybe looks very surprising, but it's, it's not. Um, I think most of you know that Friedman proved that if you have an honest-to-God integer homology sphere, then it bounds a topological contractible manifold. And this is a direct analog of that. If you have kind of a I1Z integer homology sphere, then it bounds a topological homotopy S1. Good. So. Um, once Y prime bounds such a thing, we can stick it up there. And this whole thing is, that's, that's my filling. Um, so it has pi 1 Z because of this homotopy S1 up here and because there's no pi 1 going on here. Um, it certainly has boundary Y and then you compute all of its other invariants and, and they match what you wanted by construction. Uh, question. Okay, good. Um, so I'm gonna move on to talk about surfaces now. So here's our chart again. This is the surfaces section. So, so this time I'm gonna uh, kind of fill in the whole top, uh, topological, also top uh, quadrant uh, first and then talk about the smooth stuff. So, so let me start off by making sure we agree about what a topological surface is. Um, it's not just a, a surface being embedded with a homeomorphism. I also demand that it be locally flat. <clears throat> okay? And the notion of equivalence I'm gonna use for surfaces, um, well, the, the, sort of the definition is, is equivalent, but what it is is, is homeomorphism or diffeomorphism of pairs. <clears throat> um, you could talk about surfaces up to isotopy. We have uh, a little bit to say about that, but it's messier, I, I won't say it now. So um, 
The first classification of topological surfaces is from Boyer, and, and he, he classified um, closed surfaces embedded in a four manifold X, the ambient space now I'm always taking to have no pi one. And, and Boyer also, so Boyer's classifying surfaces that are closed and such that their complement has no pi one either. So you know, an example of a surface like this might be one of the S2 factors in S2 times S2. <coughs> And um, as a consequence of our manifold theorem, we can classify uh, surfaces in simply connected four manifolds with pi one of the complement Z. And we can do that for both closed and surfaces with boundary. Uh, and, and here's the statement. Um, <clears throat> so you fix your ambient space, which has S, oh, I'm just gonna give the statement, sorry, for the result with boundary. So, so you have a fixed ambient space. The ambient space has boundary S3 and, and no pi one. And, and now what we're going to classify is surfaces in there whose boundary is some fixed knot. Again, you know, the, the surfaces are going to be equivalent, then the, the, the boundary knot had better be the same, so it makes sense to break the classification up like this. Um, and, and these surfaces have complement Z. And the invariant set is, well, it's going to be the genus of the surface, fair enough, um, and then the equivariant intersection form of the complement and the automorphism invariant of the complement. Can you ask something about the, the normal bundle? Good, yeah. Um, y yes and no. Uh, when I demand local flatness, that gives me a normal bundle for... Um, Oh, good. Um, yeah, the, nor the fact that the complement is pi one z implies that the, the, the normal bundle is trivial. Um, the little calculation. More questions? Okay, so I want to sketch how this follows from the manifolds result. <clears throat> and I'm just going to sketch it for disks. Um, morally, we're, we're just going to use the manifold result to build ourselves a, a complement of the disk. Um, so, so slightly more precisely, uh, the first thing we do, you know, I want to I apply the manifold classification. Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry, let me, let me say, I'm just sketching um, surge activity again here. So if you give me, um, an ambient space, a knot, and the three invariants, I'm gonna give you a surface in that manifold with that boundary and those invariants of the complement. <coughs> so the first thing we do is, is we take the boundary knot and we turn that knot into some other data. I'm gonna consider the zero surgery on that knot and um, the map from the pi one of that to Z coming from the abelianization map. And I'm doing that because I want to apply the manifolds classification. So now what I have is a, a three manifold a map from pi one into Z, and an equivariant form and an automorphism invariant. So the surge activity for manifolds applies, and I can build something I'll call X prime, and this is gonna function as the complement of our surface. And I, so I, I've drawn it, you know, kind of suggestively to look like that. The boundary here is the zero surgery, and this is some topological filling with pi one Z. So now I just kind of want to build this back out to give me not the complement of a disk, but in fact a, a disk sitting in X, the, the manifold you asked me to work in. And, and to do that, you, you can just attach a two handle um, to, to the meridian of the knot here. Um, and that has the effect of kind of undoing the zero surgery. So it, it's going to turn my boundary back into S3. Um, and the, the co-core disk of that two handle uh, that will turn into a disk whose boundary is the, the given knot K. Um, <clears throat> so, so now, after we add that two handle, what we have is some, some four manifold X, S3 boundary contains a disk with boundary K, and the complement of that disk has pi one Z. Uh, and, and so the final step is just to show that, that this X prime is in fact um, homeomorphic to, to X, the manifold you wanted me to work in. Questions? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I think that should be possible. We just didn't. Um, we didn't do that. Though I'm a little bit worried. Um, the first thing I'd want to check is whether, like, you want to work with surfaces that have trivial normal bundles. So, so you'd want to add whatever restrictions you ha need to make that happen. Um, yeah. That's a good question. I think that should be pursued. More questions? OK, so um, the final square uh, of the topological um, boxes up here is, is empty. That, that results not in the literature, but um, you should be able to classify surfaces like this by a combination of the techniques that are in here. So that brings us to what's going on smoothly with surfaces. <clears throat> and so, so starting off with the definition, uh, we're going to say that a surface embedded smoothly in some four manifold is exotic if there's another smooth surface embedded in that same four manifold where there's a homeomorphism of pairs but no diffeomorphism of pairs. And now we'd like to know that there are exotic surfaces everywhere where we have these classifications. <clears throat> and um, the first, so, so for closed surfaces, there's, uh, there's some stuff in the literature. <clears throat> but none of these surfaces live in particularly small um, ambient four manifolds. They all live in like, I don't know, K3 or some large sum of uh, CP2s and CP2 bars, things like this. Um, and there hasn't been so much work on trying to get exotic surfaces that live in really small four manifolds. Um, and, and that's a bit of a shame because there's, there's a conjecture you, you might want to go after. And to tell you the conjecture, let me first tell you a theorem. Um, so, so it's a theorem proved by a little bit by Friedman, a little bit by my collaborators, that if you have a topological surface in S4 and the pi 1 of the complement is z, then that surface is not very interesting. It's uh, equivalent to just the you know, if you look at the equatorial S3 and S4, and then you take the standard Hagard surface in there, um, any surface with pi 1z is equivalent to that boring one. So this is like a, an analog of the loop theorem for topological surfaces in, in S4. Um, OK, good. So, so um, this is a theorem, topologically. And, and the conjecture that, that we should be pursuing is, is, is this true? Um, smoothly, and, and this, you know, this is, I think, considered a very significant conjecture. Um, and, you know, the, the program before was to go after the Poincaré conjecture sort of coarsely by building exotica in smaller and smaller manifolds. So, so here we should be maybe going after, sorry, exotica, exotic surfaces in smaller and smaller manifolds. But that's not really being done so, so much. OK, good. Um, <clears throat> Yeah? Is it false for 1 and 2? Uh, it's open for 1 and 2. It's, I think, probably true. Um, but there's, there's kind of a, a technical problem with like a destabilization step in uh, Conway Powell's proof. OK, so that's what we know about exotica for um, surfaces without boundary. Um, the setting with boundary is supposed to be easier. Um, and it is. There's this really nice result uh, from a couple years ago by Kyle Hayden, who showed that there are exotic disks in the four ball. This is the simplest, simplest surface and ambient space you could ask for. So in a sense, this is kind of the, a disproof of the with boundary on nodding conjecture. <clears throat> So you know, just, just kind of like last time, this is maybe the end of the road. That's the simplest thing. Um, but, but we're trying to contribute to this anyway. Um, so what we proved is some kind of ubiquity statement. So, so instead of just like isolated examples in a single four manifold, we proved that there are exotic surfaces um, in any two-handle body with S3 boundary. Questions about? any of these smooth results. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, no, so, so um, Kyle has a proof not using Kavana homology uh, that came out earlier, and then a later proof with. Good. Uh, the final box here doesn't exist in the literature, but, but I think it should be fillable by techniques that are elsewhere in the smooth box. Great. So um, with the final bit of time, I'll tell you a little bit about what we know about maps. Um, <clears throat> oh, before I do that, I'll, um, you know, challenge the smooth folks to proving a structure theorem. Um, again, we, we have no positive results down here. So, you know, if you have a pair of topologically equivalent surfaces in, in the four ball, you might like to know if there's any relationship between them smoothly and um, we don't even have a conjecture. Okay. Good, so what about maps? Um, I'm gonna say less here, we don't have a theorem about maps, I just wanted to kind of finish out the literature. So, um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, we have a classification of, of homeomorphisms up to isotopy on four manifolds of all of these types in at least these, these sort of three boxes. This one is, is very new. Um, and something that's really hot right now is to compare these results to what's going on smoothly. This, this has sort of exploded in the last four years. Um, so, so we wanna find exotic diffeomorphisms. And um, <clears throat> what's, what's the definition there? Uh, we'll say that a diffeomorphism of a four manifold is exotic if there's some other diffeomorphism which is isotopic to it through homeomorphisms but not isotopic to it through diffeomorphisms. <clears throat> and, and maybe over here, um, well, right, so, so there's a couple first results for simply connected four manifolds that, that there are exotic diffeomorphisms. Um, but, but again, both of these results are on uh, very large ambient four manifolds. And you might want to try to get results on smaller uh, ambient four manifolds because there's this kind of piece of the smell conjecture that's still open which is whether there are any exotic diffeomorphisms of the four sphere. Um, of course, let me, let me remind you that the sort of full version of the Smale conjecture was, was disproved by Watanabe um, a couple years ago. Um, and that's, that's something we, we, don't, we don't really have, um, is, is, yeah, exotic diffeomorphisms of small four manifolds. And we also don't have any exotic diffeomorphisms of small four manifolds with pi 1z. So good, continuing the tradition of, of finishing up early before lunch. Uh, let me, oh, let me tell you that again, um, we have no positive results. We have no idea how any two for topologically isotopic diffeomorphisms should be related. Um, and I'll stop with that. That's, that's the full chart. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, questions, please? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by a, a small or big four manifolds. Oh yeah, sorry. I mean in terms of it's it's B two, um, just the rank of the second homology. Uh, you you could ask for other quantifiers, but usually, um, that's a sort of dumb one that that we use. More questions? There are no more questions. So let us uh, thank the speaker again.